Good morning once again to everybody. I hope everybody's having a great morning in the Lord and that we would be able to continue our worship together and our fellowship and our studies together in a way that honors God. Uh, number four of the series this morning, if you've been here since the beginning of the series, you'll know that we are talking about uh, being the church, being a members of the body of Christ, and being members of the congregation, this particular congregation or any other congregation for that matter, and some of the responsibilities that come with that, making sure that we have a good understanding, and when I say a good understanding, I mean God's intended understanding of what it means to be part of the church or part of the body of Christ or part of individual congregation. All of them are one and the same. We've talked about preserving the responsibility to preserve the unity, right, in the body of Christ, preserve the unity in the congregation at all costs, and we talked about a bunch of different things. Uh, this, the last week we talked about uh, sharing in the ministry responsibilities, basically uh, pointed out that we are all responsible for praying for the church, for the body of Christ, for the ministry, and the growth of the church specifically salvation for those who are lost making disciples that's our mission that's the mission of every church that's the mission of the gospel right that's what jesus is sending us to do so we pray that we'll be successful in that first and foremost in the meantime all the rest of our prayers are to help us be able to do that better and better including praying for the sick and praying for those who are hurting and praying for those who are struggling in all of those ways because that's all important to god so we pray for each other. Also, uh, we talked about inviting people to church, inviting people to be a part of the kingdom of God, inviting people to salvation. You got to take part in that particular part of the ministry. And we also uh, talked about warmly accepting people into the congregation, into the ministry of the body of Christ. Uh, we can't pick and choose, right, who Jesus died for, because why? Jesus died for who? Right. John three sixteen. Jesus died for whoever believed, and he also died for those who don't believe. Just because you don't believe doesn't mean he didn't die for you. Right? So the ball's in our court, isn't it? As far as being disciples and, and salvation goes. We're going to be Romans chapter 12 today and Mark chapter 10 to start with. And I'll read, uh, you can turn to Romans chapter 12 because I'm going to read quite a bit of that uh, uh, to get going. Today we are going to talk about the membership responsibility of the members of the body of Christ to be serving in the ministries of the body of Christ and in the ministries of Oak Grove Christian Church for this for, for us particularly right it, we have a responsibility to re, to serve the kingdom of God right because it doesn't make any sense uh, as far as having the fear of the Lord right having reverence for God, the creator, having reverence for his almighty uh, lordship over our existence, and also receiving the free gift of grace, mercy, and forgiveness, and then not serve him. Doesn't, it doesn't make any sense if you think about it as a whole. So how do we do this? What do we do? Let's read in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 8, and we'll talk about a few things before we finish up. Uh, Romans chapter 12 in verse 1 through uh, verse 8. We've read this before recently, and we'll probably read it again several more times uh, in the future. Verse 1, chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. All right. I think I've mentioned uh, in the past, whether it's in Bible studies or here in the sermon time, that our goal is to glorify God, to honor God with all of who we are. Every part of our life is to honor God and to show the world that God is real and that he loves everyone and that Jesus is the Christ. That's making disciples. And that's exactly what he's saying here. I, he didn't get it off of me. I got it off of him, Paul. Right? He says... Uh, in view of God's mer mer mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, meaning because Jesus died for me and because I realize I'm a sinner. You know, Matthew chapter uh, five, where we talked about uh, recognizing your spiritual poverty and then mourning over your sin. Because of that, we respond by offering our entire lives, who we are, 
submitting to God. I'm yours, Lord. Whatever you want to do with me for your glory, I'm yours. You ever said that prayer? You want to say that prayer? Have you ever had to say that prayer over again because we failed, right? It's like I have to say it every day. It's like, well, (laughs) here I am again, Lord, right? Help me to do the best I can today with your grace and your strength to honor you. And then, of course, when I get home, it's like, Lord, I'm sorry that I failed you in this way. And thank you for using me in this way, right? That's grace. That's God. That's God's love. So it's a holy and pleasing, it's holy and pleasing to God to live that way. This is your spiritual act of worship. In other words, your entire life in Christ is worship. Right? You ever think about your, your Christian life or even your entire life for that matter before and after you got saved and during and all of that is a, is a testimony about God and his love and his grace and forgiveness, right? Each one of us have a testimony. And each one of us could write a book if we would just sit down and do it and share it with people or tell it to people. Each one of us have the same story told with different characters, right? In different circumstances, but the same story is that Jesus found me when I was a sinner, a rebel against God, and he loved me anyway. And then I surrendered to him and my life has been changed forever. That's, that's everybody's story, isn't it? That's great. That's where y'all say hallelujah and praise God. Right? Don't forget, uh, we can say amen every now and then. We can praise the Lord every now and then. It's appropriate, right? Especially on Sunday morning. So here we are. He says in verse 2, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. I don't know how many times I've asked a question and people have come into my office or called me on the phone or just come up to me and said, How do I know what the will of God is for my life? You ever ask yourself that question? I hope you have, because that means you're interested in what God's wanting to do with you, right? What is God doing with you? Why, why are we still here after Jesus died and we can receive forgiveness so that we can be in the presence of God for eternity? And the answer is found in Matthew chapter 28 when Jesus says, go into the world and make disciples. There's other people that are lost too. It's not just about your salvation. It's about the whole world's salvation, Right? And he says, if you want to know what God's will for your life is, then you need to be living this way. Don't be like the world anymore. You're saved from that. You're not that way anymore. You're not the way you used to be because of Jesus. And anyone who genuinely gets saved, anyone who genuinely uh, uh, confesses Christ and repents, right, is baptized, forgiveness of their sin, for the gift of the Holy Spirit, all of that, and then so on, and continuing in the growth of uh, uh, a spiritual growth, the Christian life. We're pursuing God's will, aren't we? Now what, God? What, what do you want me to do now? We're not earning anything. Our, our dues, our works, that's a better way to say it, our works are a result of what we believe. That's how we're saved by faith. But James tells us faith without works is what? And if, you're, if your faith is dead, then you're dead in your spirit. You're lost. But if you're alive, if your faith is not dead, then you need to be doing something for the kingdom of God, don't you? And, and here's the thing. Even though we've been given the authority of God, we've been given the power of God, we've been given the wisdom of God, we've been given the strength of God, we've been given the entire kingdom and everything that comes with it of God through the Holy Spirit. To go and make disciples. So how can we lose? How can we fail? The only way I know that we can fail is by not doing. I'll give you a a perfect example of how not doing something brings failure. Just about until seventh grade every year I would experience this. Right? And I don't know why I didn't learn. But it 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 was horrible. It was horrifying every night. I know I had homework to do. And every night, my parents, one or the other, would fuss at me about doing my homework. And most nights, I would lie and say I had it done. 
And then I'd find myself in class the next day scrambling to write something on a piece of paper so I could turn it in so that everybody in the class wouldn't know that I didn't do my homework. Just to find out, at the end of the week, I get that paper back with a big fat red F on it. I failed because I didn't do the work, right? And if anybody who uh, uh, is wise in their age, whether, not whether you're old or middle-aged or still a young adult, you'll realize that the people in your life that are there to teach you. They're not there to destroy you. They're there to help you learn, right? Teachers, coaches, parents, grandparents, preachers, Bible studies teachers, all of, all of the above are there to help you succeed. God is the same way. Jesus said, go into the world and make disciples and I'll be with you always. I'll go with you. I'll send you another counselor. He's going to give us the Holy Spirit so that we can't fail. The only way we can fail is if we mess it up. And I think I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. The biggest, my biggest prayer in ministry is that I don't mess it up. That I don't get in the way of it and destroy it. Because it can happen. And, it's, and, if, and if it's going to fail, it's going to be first and foremost because I did something I shouldn't have done or did, didn't do something I should have done. Right? Because God has sent us into the, into the world to make disciples. So how can we lose if we're in tune with what he's done and given us? Because the reality is when we go into the world and make disciples, it's God who does the work, right? It's God who does the disciple making. It's God who softens a person's heart. It's God who convicts a person. It's God who draws a person to him. And he uses me and you to go do that. So you and I are tools. That's what we are. We're tools that in God's toolbox and God created these tools for specific purposes, for specific reasons. Now, I'm not going to, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to use a screwdriver to drive a nail in the wall. Well, I mean, it could happen, but it's not the best way to do it, right? So we're going to talk about serving the kingdom of God using your talents and your gifts, spiritual gifts. The things that God has given you, the things that God created you with, the things that the spirit of God brings into your life because you're saved, because you're totally surrendered to his spirit, to his salvation that he's called you to. Because you have a desire to honor him with all that you are. Because you desire that your life of worship is something that is a pleasing aroma to him. Because if it's not that way, then it's has to be a stench in his nostrils doesn't it that's not what we want that's not what i want for you my job as a preacher is not to stand up here and be famous and be cool and say look at me my job is to give you whatever it is the lord tells me to give you so that you can grow and be successful at making disciples that's what my job is right at least until God tells me to do something different. Your job is whatever the Lord has assigned you to do in the kingdom of God. And there's plenty of jobs to do. There's plenty of areas to do the ministry. Let's read some more. So we're in verse 3. It says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Right? I'm only whatever God says I am. And even that is only in Christ. Because if I've already seen what I can do when I'm left to my own resources, when, my, when I'm left to my own ideas, I've already seen the train wreck that that turns into. Right? Y'all been there. The only reason that I can even stand up here and talk in a public forum like this is because of the grace of God and whatever. See, I had to learn that I'm who this Bible says I am in Christ. Not who I th thought I was or not who, what the world said I was. Right? Because there was a time before I was saved that I couldn't even walk in a gas station, look somebody in the eye and buy a stick of gum. That's how much confidence I had in myself. Y'all like, that's not true. You can't stop talking now. I'm not the same man I used to be. I'm not. And I enjoy 
doing what I do for the Lord. I do. Not everything about being the preacher is fun. Some of it's hard. Some of it's stressful. Some of it is is pleasant. And some of it is not pleasant. Some of it is hurtful. Right? But that's true for every other part of the ministry that you guys are part of, isn't it? Just because you're saved don't mean you have a happy-go-lucky cotton candy and ice cream life, right? (laughs) Just because you're saved don't mean you don't have problems, don't mean that you're not interacting with other people. The, 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 the reality is, is we don't, we're not very nice to each other sometimes. People aren't. And we're guilty of that. Everybody's guilty of hurting somebody else's feelings at one time or another. Right? That's why Mr. Holland's poem is so powerful. It's a good reminder, wasn't it? <laughs> we're trying to honor God. We're trying to live a life of worship. We're trying to live a life that does what God needs to do for his kingdom so that people will see that he is real and that they don't have to be lost in their sin. Isn't that great? We get to be used by God. We get to be a part of the kingdom of God. The biggest and most powerful thing in existence, we get to be a part of that. Not because we deserve it, but because God loves us that that much. All right. So don't think of anything. Don't think of yourself any more than what God thinks of you. Or any less for that matter. Verse 4 says, Just as each one of us, or each of us has one body with many members, the, uh, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we who are uh, uh, many from one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Unity, remember. That's where the unity comes in. Verse 6 says, We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is uh, prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. And if it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Mark chapter 10 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be saved, but to, uh, uh, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as ransom for many. Talking about Jesus didn't come into this world to be God, even though he's God in a place, right? He didn't come here to lord over us. He came here to serve us. Can you imagine our Lord serving us? Think about that. You think about that now. Put yourself in, in a disciple's shoes. Jesus been down washing their nasty, dirty feet. I don't know about you, but I don't even like washing my own feet. But that's the way Jesus wants us to serve one another, isn't it? And if Jesus came to serve us, then who are we to think that we shouldn't be serving someone else? And if we're not seeing that being a part of the body of Christ and a part of the church is service, being a servant servanthood if we're not putting that together we're missing something and we're missing out aren't we so think about it think about it and think about it here's the number one thing by the way just so you know every church is filled with willing people you ever heard that before every church is filled with willing people some are willing to work and others are willing to let them Some are willing to serve, and others are willing to let them. I'm not trying to say that as a, like a knockdown. It's just the truth. Right? Now, we're talking about, in general, serving God. And sometimes our situations and our circumstances and our our age or uh, our abilities and our lack of abilities change over lifetime periods, don't they? So our service changes, and the way that looks changes. But never in the Bible does it say to stop serving other people and stop serving God. So the first thing is we need to discover uh, our gifts, right? We need to discover the gifts and talents that God has created us with and given us. What is a talent? A skill is something you learn, by the way. You can learn how to build a house. You can learn how to build a car. You can learn how to draw. You can learn how to paint. You can do all of that stuff, and that is a skill. Some skills can be a talent. Some people are talented enough, they just pick up a musical instrument and start playing it and don't ever take a class. Right? 
I'm not one of those people, by the way. What you heard this morning is 25 years of teaching myself. And I'm still not even close, right? But that's what, that's what you do. You learn. And whatever God allows you to learn and helps you learn, whatever God gives you to do, you do it for him. And you have fun doing it. But then there's spiritual gifts. We will get into spiritual gifts in detail in the future. But just know that God, through the Holy Spirit, is, is gifting you in spiritual ways. To be teachers, to be preachers, to be encouragers, to, be, uh, uh, to have compassion, to love in different ways. You can go through the list. We've got to find out what those are. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, And each one has received a special gift. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of, of the manifold grace of God. Do you realize that everything God does for you, even though you may benefit from it, is for his kingdom so that you can go do his kingdom work? Every blessing that you've ever experienced, every healing, every financial res, uh, uh, resource that you have, everything that God has given you in your life is so that you will go into the world and make disciples with it somehow. Isn't it great? God is so awesome that he can bless you and use you at the same time. Like whatever he pours in your cup can be shared with the world and needs to be shared with the world. And he wants it to be shared with the world. Because if you try to store it up for yourself, then guess what? The supply will be cut off because it's not for that. Not because he doesn't want, like you or doesn't, doesn't, he, he hates you because that's not what it's for. Number two. We serve the ministries of the body of Christ by being equipped for service, right? Ephesians chapter 4, 11 and 12 says he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipment of the saints for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ. You got people who teach, you got people who preach, you got people who mentor, you got people in colleges that are uh, creating uh, college classes, you got people who lead Bible studies. All these people are gifted and talented and used by God so that you and I will attend those things and be built up. For what? For the works of service. God, everything God is doing to help us grow spiritually is so that we can serve him more. Right? If I, if, let's say, if I, I'm going to try to quickly get through this. If I said, I'm going to go into this world and I'm going to make disciples until the day I die. Every person I talk to, I'm going to talk to about Jesus and I'm going to love them and I'm going to do whatever I think they need so that they can know that God is real. But I'm never going to read this Bible and I'm never going to talk to God. I can just imagine, I can just imagine God looking at me. If I were to say something like that, God looking at me saying, yeah, good luck with that. Let me know how that works for you. Not because he's a jerk, but because he knows that I need to learn something. If that's, that's not the way I am, but if I were that way, right? The door is wide open to God because Jesus died on the cross. That's what the book of Hebrews is all about. Because of Jesus, we can go before our Lord at any time with confidence. And then when he showed us how to pray in Matthew chapter 6, he said, go to God, recognizing him for who he is, ask him for what you need for the ministry work. And by the way, he'll take care of these other things that are worrying you that are getting in the way of you doing the ministry work. Oh, and then deal with Satan. You notice how that was at the end of Jesus' prayer? Deliver us from evil. Like, he, like, it's like we should put it at the end like we're not even concerned about it. Because our God is greater than Satan and anything he can bring to us. Y'all agree with that, I can tell. So, so when we pray, we're saying, hey, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make disciples. I, I want you to help me with this. Help me, guide me in this. Lead me where to go. Show me what to do. Help me see people the way you want me to see people. And by the way, this family over here, I'm brokenhearted about this. Or this person in my family is needing this, and I, and I wish that they could get better. Or I got this financial need, and it's really distracting me because I'm worried about it. But I want to be focused on your work. So please take care of that, and I'm going to put it in your hands and leave it there. Oh, by the way, can you deal with Satan because he's aggravating? That's, that's it. That's faith. That's confidence in God and his plan. 
of ministry for us. So we got to be equipped. The only way to get that confident is to be in the Word all the time, be in prayer all the time, be in fellowship all the time, encourage one another all the time. As soon as one person doubts, we walk up and say, Man, that's, I understand how you feel, but that's not who we serve, right? And that's not, just because Satan said that don't mean that's the end of it. Somebody gets uh, just so discouraged that they start missing the fellowship every now and then. Somehow we all got to go after. We got to go, hey, hey, what's going on? What can we do to help you, right? Because there's disciples that need to be made. There's people going to hell because they're not saved every day. Every day there's somebody going to hell because they're not saved. And I hope, and I hope I'm not so wrapped up in my worries that Jesus tells us not to worry. Remember Matthew chapter 6, right before that Lord's Prayer? Don't worry. He'll take care of it. If I'm so wrapped up in my worries, I'm not doing the work of the kingdom. I'm not serving God that way. I'm not serving other people. When I'm distracted from making disciples, I'm not serving God and I'm not serving people. And I need to get back on track. Same with everybody else. So we're doing this so that we can help one another. The more we serve one another, the more we're building each other up so that we can be better at going into the world and making disciples. By the way, the church, if we would go out into community and just serve the community, you'd be amazed how fast we can make disciples out of them. Right? It's, it's, it's better to serve somebody and love somebody than it is to just point your finger at them and say, you need to get in church or you're going to hell. Even if that's true, that's not how to do it, is it? Because I certainly wouldn't respond to that. I don't think anybody in here would respond to that. So we need to find ways to go out and serve people. In Jesus' name. In the name of our, our God. The kingdom which is bigger than anything in this world. The next thing we need to do is we need to develop a servant's heart. And I think number one and number two lead to number three. Right? It's not like you just wake up and say, I'm going to try to have a servant's heart this morning. I'm going to try to uh, change my heart. I'm going to try to do something. It's not, that, it's not that we do it on our own. This is what we become. This is what becomes of us. This is what God does in your heart. The more you submit to him, the more you love others, the more you love him, the more you serve others, the more feet you wash, the softer your heart gets. And the more available you become to God. And the more he can use you. Right? Because every one of you, God, didn't, God doesn't make mistakes and he doesn't do things without a purpose. And when you, when you were created, he said, I need a tool for this. I need a tool for this purpose, and I'm going to put it in my toolbox until I'm ready for it. And here we are. And every time he needs that tool, you or me, he'll grab that tool and he'll use it. He's not going to grab another tool and use it because that tool is for something else. I don't know how many times I've said to God, you got, you got millions of other believers, Lord. Why can't you use somebody else to do that? Not because I didn't want to serve God. It was just that the task that he was asking me to do, what he was asking me to do was so hard for me to do. Not for anybody else, but it was, it was for me, it was difficult for me to love a certain person in the way that he was wanting me to love them. Not that I didn't want to love them, but it was just hard. And it was just easier for me to say, why don't you just use somebody else, God? That's what Moses tried to do, right? Moses was like, uh, 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 you're not sending me, are you? I can't do it. He told me, I can't do it. I can't do it until God finally said, all right, I'm going to send you some help, but you're going, whether you like it or not. And look what God did with him. God did some great things with Moses because Moses believed and finally submitted. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 says, do nothing from selfish or, uh, uh, selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. I have tried to tell myself since I've been saved, or shortly after, that if I go about the Lord's business, he will always be about my business. And if I focus on his business, he will always be about the things that would distract me and make me worry about my life. And I'm still telling myself that because I fail every now and then. As many times as I told myself that I still fail, find myself in worry or find myself in stress over something in life that I know God will deal with. Look around the room. If we just focus on serving each other and serving the community, if everybody's doing that, then God will, God will serve you through those people. 
he will take care of your business. You will have what you need. You will be encouraged if you need encouragement. You will be comforted if you need comfort. You will be, uh, you will be convicted if you need conviction. You will be accountable if you need to be accountable. This is how the body of Christ works, and this is a responsibility of the members to participate in this. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 says, But empty, he emptied himself, uh, taking the form of a bondservant, talking about Jesus, and being made in the likeness of men. Jesus left the, the presence of God and came into the world, making himself like us, like taking a large step down so that he can serve you and me. And we sing songs about that, don't we? And if we're going to be like Jesus, if we're going to be Christians, which is what, what that means, be like Jesus, we need to have our hearts developed by God. We need to have servants' hearts. We, it's not something we, have to, we should have to think about. It's not something that we need to try to do. It becomes who we are. Because Jesus is right we we would we will we will have to wrestle each other to get in line to serve somebody else that's i mean that's the way it's supposed to be no 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 i'll, I'll handle this one i'll watch these feet over here no 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 i'm watching those feet right life is hard and people uh we all have lives that aren't so fun sometimes and loving people is not as easy as it really seems if you really get into it. It's one thing to come to church and say, hey, how you doing? Hope everything's going well and we'll pray for you and this and that. And that's great. But to really get involved in people's lives and share life together and help one another and encourage one another, use our spiritual gifts, use our talents, and together go out into the world and serve the community so that God would be glorified and that people would get saved, it means you're going to get dirty spiritually there was a book and i can't even remember who wrote it i've been trying to remember since i was sitting over there a while ago this guy wrote a book uh, they smell like jesus i'll take it back they smell like sheep these people they're the, the leaders of the church the christians they should smell like sheep and sheep don't smell good you ever been a sheep farmer they don't smell good because they're just dirty animals but if you're going to get involved in the body of Christ, you're going to get involved in the kingdom of God. You're to go out into the world and get God's sheep. And sometimes it means things are ugly. Sometimes it means things aren't pleasant. And sometimes it means you're going to get your feelings hurt. You're going to get offended. You're going to get rejected. You're going to be, you might get loved by somebody. You might get thanked by somebody. The bottom line is we got to be about God's business of making disciples and totally surrender our lives and our business to him. Make sense to y'all what I'm saying? So membership in the body of Christ, membership in the church is all about becoming a servant. Love your neighbor. Remember Jesus taught that? Love your neighbor. Now, we have this bad habit of trying to pick our neighbors. You buy a house, you go and you look at the neighborhood. Do I want to live here? Do I want to live around the people that live in here? That's what people do. I think it's all right. But when it comes to the Christian life and the kingdom of God and the disciple-making work that we need to do, we don't get to pick our neighbors. It's not up to us. We love the people that are standing right in front of us every moment of our lives. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what we should want to do. Because our hearts are tender and we have servant hearts. And we live in the reality that it's only by God's grace and his forgiveness that we could even be in his presence. And none of us deserve that. Because somebody loved you and somebody loved me when I was in the pig pens rolling around in the mud that I created by my own decisions. Somebody came in there and got dirty and kept telling me that Jesus loves me and that Jesus is the Christ and that I don't have to live that way until I woke up and came to God and said, I need you. And I'm telling you, I made a big mud hole. And God is continuously cleaning that mud off of me. 
That's salvation. That's the Christian life. Starts with deciding what you believe about Jesus. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Do you believe that Jesus came in the flesh so that he could die on the cross because you and I have sinned against the Holy God? We've offended him. We've disobeyed him. We've acted like he's not even in charge. And the only way to fix that, Jesus. Because God says, I demand death for the offenses against me. So Jesus came and he died and he was resurrected from the dead, defeating death, completely defeating death permanently for the rest of eternity. Which, that's, that's where you all say hallelujah and praise God because me and you have no, have no need to worry about it ever again. I don't know why we don't wake up, we, meaning myself and everybody else in this world who knows Jesus, I don't know why we don't wake up in the morning and can't wait to run out the door screaming that Jesus is alive and that he can be sa- you can be saved. <laughs> right? It's because, it's because we get distracted. That's all. It's because we get distracted. If you want to be saved, if you're in that moment where you just, need, you just need to know that you're saved and that if Jesus came back today, you would be with him. If you need to know that, you, 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 if you believe that, come down here and just say so and we'll baptize you and all that stuff, what, what, the, what the Bible tells us to do. But if you need to know more about it and you're just not sure, just come and talk to me. Come and talk to any of these other believers that are right here. There's no need to go any further without Jesus. The rest of us, let's just go love people. Let's go serve people. Find ways to serve people. You ready? Let's sing together. Let's stand together and sing.